massive knowledge of uh, this playful, funny, strange, at times awkward, based on Wittgensteinian ideas, sort of, sort of not, with great playfulness to it. And I just remember being stunned. And in fact, years later, going through the files at, at uh, the Penguin Books, which had published the book, I dug up, in fact, a letter that was addressed to me, in a job I had years and years ago, introducing this, this writer, David Foster Wallace, and his, his extraordinary first novel. Uh, you know, that was my first encounter with him. I actually still have a copy of the book that I read. Um, I won't take up more time right now, but there's other periods of my interest in David that move forward. But that was my first, first fellow month of that.
even for pretty good reading, you know, it was just, I mean, for me at least, it was just gone. And, and here was this funny 24 year old reviving it. Um, it was really eye opening. Yeah. Um, that's, that's, uh, that, that's a big part of what, you know, he accomplished at a time before, well before, if it had just was a glimmer on, on, on the horizon. Uh, anyway, so I was looking for the early stories and, and, you know, grabbed Girl with Curious Hair the minute it came out and, and read those. And by then I was deep into my long apprenticeship working at, as a bookseller and watching a few others of my contemporaries, including the kids I'd gone to school with at Bennington publish and feeling very much like the the, the tortoise in a world of hares. And um, so I then I was reduced to being just his kind of fan. And he was he was you know fascinating because he was so uh, overtly brainy. He just was he was the hare. He was omnivorous. He wanted to think about everything and it was it was hugely intimidating and, 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 and beautiful to watch. And, and then, you know, I honestly, I, I also have a, a lull in my, in my readerly attention to him, which probably corresponds, or anyway, has to do with my progress into my own writing life. And I've, I've enjoyed a kind of renewed connection to his fiction uh, recently, in many ways sparked by uh, Julius and his cohort here, connections with um, the readers for whom he has uh, meant so much, and 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 conversations that have drawn me back into uh, a renewed appreciation for, for what the work uh, what the work represents, as opposed to the, the baggy legacy <laughs> issues, um, which which can be quite obtrusive. Um, I don't know if that be Daniel and John Di disentwining. Life and art in this case. Now, I don't think you do the job of holding the, the Disney seat after. Legacy. We'll do it, but you know, you have quite a mark on the students. Well, yeah, no, that is the, another thing to, to mention, which, you know, uh, is very tangible here, even though those uh, who, who can testify graduated, is that he was obviously a brilliant teacher. And, and it's, it was so, uh, it's such an extraordinary and particular uh, vibration that you get entering the space where he did, he did that work. Uh, so that, that's, that's another, you know, that's something completely apart because not every good writer uh, is uh, any kind of teacher at all. Father and married his mother, and his father's ghost 
just come back and say, you have to kill them and kill them. And he really has no way out. And, um, and he ends up dead for that reason. And that, thinking about that, and thinking about the idea of traps and openings, and, and what the situation for the incandescent in boys in, in Infinite Jest is, especially at the beginning of the novel, they are each trapped in a particular way, and, and their trap has to do with their relationship with their parents. And it's and they're trapped specifically because they're not aware of the fact that they're trapped. And um, and you know, I, I know it's been argued that um, that they they never really entirely get out, but I think that by the end of the level they are at least aware of situation and it's this question of you, how can you um, escape the legacy of, of your, your parents um, if you can't even admit to yourself how similar to them you are. <laughs> I think that is the classic um, dilemma of I was thinking, like, you know, I haven't had uh, time to anticipate this question too, and I was thinking about it um, on, 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 on terms of uh, a, a notion that I that I've absorbed, probably uh, and misused from the from the physical sciences um, of a of a evolutionary principle called neoteny that uh, that I, I it's a very attractive one to me. Um, and I saw so my misapplication is one I drag out at every opportunity. Um, <laughs> and and neoteny is, is the principle in, in, in evolutionary science that um, a species advances by retaining characteristics that were typical of the child or adolescent uh, um, stage of some earlier creature. So, I mean, a really obvious, really easy way to, 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 to make this uh, tangible for you is, is uh, we're, we're neotenous uh, to our, our predecessors in that our heads are disproportionately large on our bodies and that the infants of some of the apes that are our predecessors or some of the proto-humans, proto-human hominids that are our ancestors their babies look more like us than the adults did. And uh, you know, our, our, our hairlessness, our relative hairlessness, our large heads, our cranial size, that's a version of neoteny. Um, the reason this compels me is because this description starts to strike me as being one of the ways that arts advance, or culture advances, that uh, you know, in embarrassing and exalted ways, that things that kids do or think about, or are helplessly, the behavior they helplessly exhibit can become, if it's cherished and framed and ritualized in the hands of uh, an artist or, or a cultural creator of some kind, can become something that suddenly will interest adults enormously or seem tremendously relevant or even transformative to the culture of the adult human beings. You know, and so it's a, it's a very fancy way also of saying that Play is at the heart of uh, a lot of what matters to me when I when I write, and that I I, I believe is at the heart of what matters in writing in general. Things that emerge fundamentally as aspects of play uh, or 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 pretense, kind of dress up games, uh, the the kinds of things that people sometimes like to believe they grow out of or or will tend to want to be embarrassed about if they continue to do them. And in, in, in Wallace's case, I feel he's, he's, he's really a, a powerfully neotenous creator because he takes all kinds of things that uh, writing or writers are meant to grow out of or, or, or shed and he kind of exalts them and frames them and pushes them to the foreground and turns them into his, his art. And they're problematic, they're not easy, but they're very much aspects of, uh, of his own development 
that in a sense he almost froze in place and turned into his art form. The, the, the questions that writers are, are supposed to ask themselves and then solve before they go out of doors. He wore out of doors as his dress. <laughs> they were his whole job was to just constantly live inside these problems and these questions. Well, what sort of ones are you just well, well, I think that one, one example is the, the um, kind of self-consciousness that is so both disabling and enabling to his, to his work. It's constantly uh, interrupting what he seems to want to do and tormenting him, and yet that interruption and that torment becomes the work itself. It becomes its distinction. Uh, these are things that you're supposed to have solve your shit. Off into, 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 into maturity. Maybe also to kind of focus on literally on game. And absolutely, the, the focus on playing. Things that a lot of people might cut out of it all, that it's still in there. There's, there's a moment in Infinite Jest, there's this, just this joke, and there's this sort of kind of joke you tell in the bar. It's about three pages long about a, a guy who uh, was filing a damage claim and he's been hit on the head by it. No, I think it's a joke that exists long before <laughs> the book, but anyway. But I mean, it's kind of that, that you tend to write at two in the morning and you know cut at seven in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was just going to bring up one other interesting ramification of this, which is, you know, in a, in a funny way, I was just listening to what Laura was saying. I hadn't thought of that before. I spent so much time thinking about the life. But in a lot of ways, I think when David was, you know, David's own life uh, in regard to his work can be seen as a kind of struggle to adulthood with some very dramatic consequences where he very viscerally disowns almost everything he writes as he goes on to write something else. So for instance, Broom of the System, this book that gave me such pleasure, within two or three years, he's referring to it as the kind of thing he hates the book, he really hates the book. He refers to it as, a, as it strikes him now as the kind of thing a smart 14 year old would have And then he writes him in a jest, uh, and shortly after he jest, you know, he never quite repudiates him in a jest in the same way that he repudiates Broom of the System, but he does come pretty close <coughs> Gail King to say, you know, I absolutely am not going to write the same book I wrote that in a jest. And I think there's an undertone there of him thinking that these books were, were always immature. Uh, and one can draw it out of a life in different ways, but simply on the literary level, I think he looked on these past books as childlike. Extraordinary considering what's in them. But I don't I mean I think that the Gail King in a lot of ways was, was meant to be his grown up novel. Some of those names 
are still really with us and they, they exemplify this vibration, this feeling. Someone like Kurt Vonnegut or Thomas Pynchon. And Donald Arthur May, who's uh, received some nice kind of, uh, you know, renewed attention recently. And other names that you'd associate with this vibration are, have been really <coughs> effaced. They're just not around. You know, someone like Richard Brodigan, uh, or even writers who are still publishing but are just barely ever spoken of, like, like John Barth, who, you know, in the 70s had giant bestsellers and won the National Book Award, but I find that he's a name that many of my students won't know, and I don't blame them. I think that he's just not in the conversation anymore. And this kind of work was, uh, it was uh, always very mentally, uh, You know, freewheeling, very linguistically playful, uh, very politically alert, and it was hugely uh, international in flavor. It was really, really engaged with South American fiction. It was really engaged with uh, some sort of neighbor maximalists in, in, in Europe, especially some German writers, and uh, and it was it was overtly brainy and literate and full of reference and um, and also had a, a tremendous degree, maybe a fatal degree of uh, vanity to it. There was a kind of preening uh, intellectual self-congratulation that was a flavor that sometimes went into this work. And on the other hand, there, there was a lot of possibility that it represented. It seemed to chart out a world of, um, you know, versions of what you could do uh, that, that corresponded to the counterculture. And so I think that, ha it's not an accident that it was kind of rolled back at the same time that a lot of other things were rolled back in favor of a, something a little more traditional and austere and um, tended to have a kind of, uh, you know, it was claimed for it in a way that it had an overt moral ground. The other thing that was happening at the same time was um, was the falling apart of what you have written in the past. Uh, of, you could have written up as the Rushmore syndrome, and I feel like the metafictionists that you're talking about are people who thought they were going to inherit that those thrones. Right. Okay. So let's let's say names because it's going to be so much more. You know, so in the, so in the 50s and 60s, they thought they were going to be the next Mailer Styron. And for a tiny moment, they kind of were. And then things got very different. And things got different in a lot of ways that we could probably be glad of. Um, they got, for one thing, much more multicultural. Yeah, I mean, that was, that's the other thing. You can't just say, oh, it was all right. about minimalism. Right. There was this huge blossoming of literature from smaller <laughs> and women. And so what I see in moments that I don't see in the metafictionists who I don't like as much as you do, is that um, is the, the less of a bogus sense of authoritativeness. And so the- I think that's fair. So I'm questioning, there is no longer the belief that, that they, that I, white guy, get to speak to the entire culture in America. Right, that's absolutely true. But there's also a theory of what fiction can do that's being argued about. And in many ways, that theory was deliberately shrunk. It was like, fiction can and should be- yeah. That situation, both the conservatism, but also just the feeling of like, what am I entitled to talk about? Right. Like, I only have this tiny plot of, yeah. of territory that I have any authority to speak of. I think there was really a crisis of authority in the office. Yeah, that's, that's probably right. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of ways to think about um, what was going on then, but I, I think, you know, when you when you move forward and when it gets complicated with Wallace, it's easy to see the movement of the system as kind of a response to that, but. You can adjust this in some funny ways, both a book that looks past um, uh, metafiction and writers like Barth and Cougar, and also looks behind them, uh, actually far enough behind them to look for a kind of entirely, truly moral voice in fiction that in some way, you, I'm not even sure that David would have said there was a model in the English language. I think his best, uh, his best example would follow to Dostoevsky. I don't know that he ever found an English language model for the kind of moral fiction. I know how it's always risky with a large group to assume people have read these novels, especially when the novel is larger than a thousand pages. 
But there is, there are sort of two aspects of infinite chess. One is a kind of rival, fun thing that's not entirely unlike Boom of the System, though different. And that's the you can get to the family of which we've been speaking. It's a family that went to tennis academies, it's dysfunctional, highly verbal, in some ways sort of descendant of Salomon, who's by his family. And then there's a very odd, long, long, long section of the book, but it's half the book, it seems to take over the book, which is really about a halfway house of a group of, of addicts and recovery addicts. Um, led by a, a man named John Gately, who almost has a whole sort of Christ-like moment where he lies, he's shot, uh, he's prevented kind of a, an attack on the halfway house, he lies unmedicated because he's in recovery, so he can't take any pain medication. He sort of lies there, again, very much like the Dostoevsky novel, um, abiding, trying to trying to endure the pain. Um, so in that, and that certainly wouldn't, I mean, that doesn't really look back at all at it. I mean, there would be nothing more strange than to find a moment like that in, in John Barth or, or Barthelby or Hoover. I mean, this, is, this was something that really, I mean, and maybe John and, and Laura have different ideas or, or, or Julius, but I can't think of models of English language for that. Well, I, I mean, I, I like your description. I think you're right that, that he was there. I mean, he, he sensed enormous limitations in that legacy. But I also think there's a, there's a strange way in which what happens in this fiction, you know, with Infinite Jest and Beyond, the stories that, that come after it, and is still happening at Pale King, has to do with, I mean, this is where my, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in love with my Neonic theory, that he takes the problem of that argument and he turns it into the engine that generates the fiction. Because it isn't that he's rejected those tools, or even some of the young ones, the grotesquely satirical material, you know, in you know the, the giant babies and, and, and other devices like that, that could very much come out of a Cooper. And he's he's insisting that they coexist with this other thing that he wants to do, and and creating a lot of readerly anxiety. As a lot of strangeness, a lot of problems for himself, uh, abiding with and believing in his own creation, which the solving of those on the page, the earning of the right to do what he was doing, becomes the drama in many ways. And that's why I think he's such an intimate writer to read, because he seems to be in some sort of impossible situation as he writes. And I think that impossible situation has to do with not saying that uh, a yes or a no to either whole of this context for the work he was going to do. But somehow try to embrace all of them at once, do both things simultaneously, and transcend them. And in a, in a way, the, the trying to do them at once becomes the transcending. I mean, you know, he is, there's, a, there's a famous essay, and I think a really problematic essay, uh, called Evil and Pluribus, where he talks about this problem. He really names names. He talks about writers who he thinks are knocking on a door, and others who he thinks have run out the string of, you know, kind of postmodern fiction. And and he makes a call for another kind of thing, and that's that's what you're describing. But I, I think he gets there, you know, not by inventing a third thing, but by uh, writing about the trouble, writing about the problem, the tension between his penchant for games, his playfulness, his jokes, his punning, his absurd asides, his digressiveness, all the things that the self-consciousness and you know the, the appetite for you know, bizarre information, all the things that are going to distort the emotional moral center of his work. And he wants to write about the emotional moral center at the same time. And so the struggle to do both becomes the drama that generates the fiction. Although if you look at the pale thing, which is David's posthumous novel, uh, you know, I've seen, I think I've seen the manuscripts, so I, I know what's not, roughly speaking, I know what's not in the book. And there's very little of that. I mean, there's really, he seems very determined to try and create a single, a single approach. I don't think he does it, because I don't think that's his nature. So if you look at certain sections of it, I don't know how many people would have read it, but I mean, there's some that are still fairly kind of comic and extreme. And then, but the, the preponderance of the book is meant to try and move you into almost a Buddhist state of calm and repose. And the idea of the book is, that if we could only, if we were only willing to be bored, we would pass through boredom into some sort of state of calm, some, something that would 
that would change our relationship with ourselves and our anxiety really about death. I mean, I think a lot of what the book is really about being anxious about death and how do you get past that. In the interview that I did with him related to, to just after he just came out, one of the things that I asked him about was the, um, the cliches of the 12 step movement, like build the wall and every night or one day at a time, that, that kind of thing. And um, the kind of the chagrin at realizing that you aren't so smart that you can't use those. And, and, and he talked about how uh, the, the, the difficulty that he had, or he was actually including both of us in this, uh, so he said, you and I might look at you know, those sayings and say, well, they're just not very intellectually interesting. They're just um, good and all or whatever. But, um, but they're real. They have this meaning. And, um, and the, the whole halfway house part of that novel was about trying to crack that open, or trying, or trying to live with the fact that the thing that most needs to be said is a cliche. It's really, when, you, when you're someone who just loves the inventive use of language so much. Laura has one of my favorite descriptions of David and her slot. He's actually it's so funny that the three of us, that you're the only one who met him. I never met David. You never met him either. Um, uh, but she describes him as having the, uh, the affect of a reformed smart aleck. <laughs> and I think of that all the time, you know, I think, especially David had a large reputation as a smart aleck, and then he appears in this book, and the chest, I think a lot of reviewers and critics, the interviewers really couldn't figure out whether this was real, or whether it was just, just put on, like, yet another layer of, of, um, of blather that he had laid on, where, you know, he's suddenly this earnest guy, when, Everything he'd been about before that was this kind of hyper verbality and this this really this incredibly ironic individual, this person who couldn't even glimpse with where the center was. Um, I'm curious, I mean you you sat with him and you you went away feeling that he had changed or that you or that he was sort of still trembling between well, changing and wanting to change. No, but he was in recovery. Right. He was in recovery at that particular moment, but I didn't you know, he wasn't admitting. Whatever twelve step movement he had been through, and so he spoke of it as something that he had learned about from other people who had gone through it. It's like yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was like, I don't know. I was like, I was friend, and I was friend. I was like, okay. <laughs> Did you know? I mean, you assumed, right? I assumed that I, I, it was. You know, the thing is, is that you never know with a really good novelist. Right. There was an article in the Times the other day about the Jeffrey Jennings sections of the. Jeffrey and Jenny's novel that are set in this biology lab where they're doing all this research on yeast. And he just like picked it up out of like he taught, he read some papers on the internet, and all these scientists were like, oh, it's exactly what It's conceivable that someone could just know someone who had gone through all of these things and then just extrapolate from there. They have an amazing imagination, which is back that they have. And a lot of time, which you also have. Yeah. I mean, but he could have gone to hundreds and hundreds of recovery meetings and just been a, you know, some meetings were open. And people still didn't talk about it that much back then. I mean, now people talk about it all the time, you know, as an experience that they've had. But back then it was a little bit more taboo. And he was also kind of secretive, just inherently, as a lot of us are. And, um, and so, uh, you know, he clearly found those mottos and it, it, it was a, it was a, it was a, uh, yeah, he was, I thought, I thought he was being sincere about that, but that was the problem, is that he had learned that as clever as he was, he was helpless, and that these people who could just, what they had to give him were these ridiculous cliches, actually were the only ones who could show him a way out of this situation that he had been in, and, um, and I, I think for a lot of brainy people, the, uh, the whole sort of well step thing is so formulaic and really anyone can do it. I think it's humbling. And that, that that's one of the things that has to be. Uh, because one of the things that an addict like that has, which you see in a lot of who's writing about addiction, is the belief that they can have a witness thing. So, um, so yeah, my feeling is that he was conscious of the fact that he needed to go on a 
I mean, one of the funny things about David is that he had a certain kind of imagination that almost completely lacked another kind. Um, and uh, he was desperate. You know, one of the sort of paradoxical gifts of his time in recovery was that it exposed him to a whole world of people he would never have met through any other route. And almost the first days of his time in a, in a, a halfway house, we went to a recovery house, we went and he had his notebook out. And almost like, almost, like, almost a cliche imitation of what writer would do, which is, you know, his ears were wide open, he was working on his own problems, his ears were wide open, and he wasn't going to let this opportunity get away from him. He was, in some ways, and I'm putting this slightly too simple, but actually, weirdly enough, in David's case, for all the immense complexity of what's going on on one level, David was always very, very hungry for material. And what Lori's talking about with Jeff Eugenides, which is simply taking a few facts and spinning a, uh, like making them your own, really wasn't his gift particularly. He, he was a great witnesser. He, Later life, especially, and then some of this had to do with having trouble getting his last novel out. But I mean, he would, if he knew a friend was going to propose, he would like ask if he could come along and watch. That's, that's, a, that's a literal example. I mean, and, I mean, John, John, we can talk more about this than I can, but you know, some writers don't need to do that. They don't need to see it. You know, they have enough knowledge within their own histories and in their own imaginative. I mean, his imagination was enormous, it just wasn't that particular kind of imagination. It's interesting to hear that because, I mean, again, I think that one of the areas of real uh, fascination, one of the most fertile aspects of his work persistently is that his characters are, uh, in some way, um, they project and they, 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 they recapitulate this issue that they are trying to believe that other people exist. And they want to get close to work because their faces to the glass of other human beings because they have a deep, deep suspicion that they might not have an interior. And they want to, they want to somehow look inside. And so, the, again, the issues of the writer measuring their gifts or their capacities and also limitations becomes part of the subject matter for so, and generates so much attention in his work. You know, I don't know if I believe in other characters besides the voice, besides the narrator, besides, uh, you know, Wallace. But damn it, I couldn't make my characters suffer this problem so powerfully that either they or I will break through and die trying. It's like he's merged that issue into the work itself. I think, I think you know, that whenever you talk about David, you're eventually going to get to these layers and layers in the way that, um, I'm one thing that seems very satisfying as writer, I think, especially at a certain age, is that you know, he very much, you know, I wouldn't say he invented, but he pushed forward a certain kind of relentless self-questioning that also would have an aspect of kind of going down the rabbit hole. Um, and one of the excitements of his fiction is to watch, especially a book like Infinite Jest, I think John had touched on this before, how, you know, there's this, you, you sort of, the whole thing is just not writable. You know, it just can't be written. You can't be that uncertain about, you know, reality. You can't be that uncertain about when to turn off the machine consciousness and get a book out. Uh, and there again, I think there's an interesting contrast with, with the, the, the minimalist, which is, the minimalist writing is all about editing out. Um, uh, I remember, you know, this is not to bring it all back to drug use, but I can remember the first time I read through this system, like, I just knew instantly that this was a book that was, you know, that, that basically the, the shorthand was that this was a book that, that was written under the influence of pod, and the minimalists were cocaine addicts. <laughs> uh, which I mean, and I'm, I'm simplifying here, but it's a certain truth to it, you know, um, from the system of the books from the 70s that we're talking about, a certain amount of fondness and also a certain amount of, of, of horror, you know, they, they have that quality, you know, they're inclusive, they're late night bull, bull sessions. Um, and, and the middle of this is the opposite, that certain kind of tightened anxiety, a, high, a very high level of anxiety in minimalist writing, a high level of not wanting to bore you, a high level of, you know, other things more important for you. Do, whereas these 70s novels was all about like you had nothing but time. I think one, one of the cool, cool things about it the jest is it sort of, you know, it sort of does both. It sort of says you have nothing but time. On the other hand, I have this tremendous anxiety that I'm wrong. Yeah. It's a wonderful moment in there where we're talking about interiorized, where there's a line about how the condenser is one of the two central consciousnesses of the book. There's, I mean, one should probably argue that Wallace is the central consciousness of the book, the two central characters of the book. Um, where he says that, it, that he has no interior at all. He says that he's simply a person without an interior. And I, I've never found that to be true about him, which is one of the funny things about the book. 
grows a sort of dollop of, of self-hatred of David and sort of the happiness in his own life, but also I think investing in some of his characters, this sort of, this sort of self-hatred, this sense that I'm worse than I really am, which I also think animates, and I think it touches a lot of readers, I think a lot of us have the suspicion that we're worse than we really are. Um, and so you take this book away and you, you get this, this incredible melody. So you've uh, you started talking about these issues a little bit, but one of the one of the central questions of Wallace's work generally, uh, particularly in the jest, is the question of the relationship between addiction and passion and the relationship between entertainment and art. And now with the Pale King, we have another another avenue uh, down which to go talking about that question by including the idea of boredom. Uh, so I'm hoping that you guys can talk maybe about how reading to digest with, with some knowledge of the Pale King's content uh, and, and Wallace's work generally can help illuminate how, how he thought about these issues at particular moments, in particular works, and towards the end of this one. Well, I mean, I'll just write a little bit of biographical uh, trivia, which is the original, the original subtitle of the Chess was A Failed Entry. He worked extremely hard to do two things in the book, I think. One was not to make it so damn amusing that you forgot that you were supposed to be doing the work of reading. He had a word for that kind of amusement. The word was spectation. He was, he was from his own biographical reasons, but, but also just from a kind of moral or ethical point of view, very, very worried that, that reading his books would be like basically like watching TV or reading any easier fiction. But what's interesting, at the same time, he creates a book Who's made, you know, the, I don't know how many of you have gone to page 70 of the book, you know, how many of you have read the book, how many of you read the book five times. But I think the book is really designed to frustrate you on the first reading with, this, with the idea that you're going to recapitulate the act of addiction by going back and having to read it over and over because you're always trying to search for the meaning of it. And the book literally has no, people will argue about this, and, 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 um, and sure, the book, the book has no certain ending. I mean, there's a couple of good theories about what happens at the end. But anyway, it's a circle, you know, and thematically circles are all over the book as well. So I think he I think he sits in this very tense place between, you know, making it work and making it addictive work. A very strange idea as opposed to addictive pleasure. And then, um, you know, he was known for putting out the syllabus of books that most people would regard as simply entertaining. That's true. And I'm wondering, I've always wondered, you know, when he gave that list of Ten books. Right, right. I've always wondered, you know, there's so much to say about how sincere that book is. There's a Tom, there's a Tom, Tom Clancy novel. Yeah. What is the book? There's a Tom Clancy novel. There's Thomas Harris, is one of the Thomas Harris novels. Do you remember the rest? Well, I, what always fascinated me since I wrote a book about C.S. Lewis was that the number one one was Screwtape Letters. He loved the Screwtape Letters. He did love them. And he, and he, he would press them on people at, at, at any turn. I think he loved the irony and the complexity of the voice there. So that's real. The one I can't figure out for the life of me, which I'm on the same list, is Fear of Flying. Because <laughs> that doesn't even fit within his list. Yeah. You know, he likes the relatives. And Fear of Flying sits in this weird place, it's kind of, you know, sort of pseudo lit I don't know pseudo literature, but it sort of fits in a place that, that writers, spent writing like David traditionally, would dislike most of all because it's just a little bit of a breath of anxiety to it, which is, you know, it's, it's, not, a, it's, it's not a thrill, but it's not a genre book. It's a uh, film memoir. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's too simple to be literature, but it's well above the genre book, and obviously millions and millions of people read it at pleasure. I don't know what that one's doing on the list. I mean, I throw that open to the floor. I do not know. That may have been just his, you know, his F you to the reader. I don't know. Maybe his way of saying, I don't want to do these lists. I don't I'm just laughing because I, I didn't know this list. I've never seen this. Oh, yeah. but I, I read the Fear of Flying four or five times when right. I was about 16 years old. Well, that, 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 <laughs> it's, it's a novel that honestly I can remember as well as any novel I've ever read. I think you may have just solved the puzzle. Either. <laughs> I mean, 
there's no there's no gravity's rainbow. There's no there's no tension. Like, you know, I don't think there is. But I, I think there's not, I mean, I, I, for all time I was saying this, there was a, I think it was published in the Raleigh News and Observer. Uh, it's only Peter Zane just asked him for his list. I'm sure he got these, these yeah, requests. Yeah, it was for a collection. It was like a Oh, right. Was, yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. right. yeah, it was by Peter Zane. And it was for a book about Polish writers' love or something like that. I'm sure John feels these, these requests. That guy yeah. asks people to do a lot of things. So the fact that it was Peter Zane it uh -huh. increases the chance that it was done in a flippant. Uh, <laughs> Try to struggle back to Julius's question. <laughs> um, you know, this this question of um, you know whether uh, language could be used to do something besides make up your language, I think, is really is really. Uh, it generates a lot of fear in in Wallace and you know in his characters, and uh, the question of what writing is for, what fiction is for, what art making is for, you know, this I'm again referencing a conversation I had very early on with Julius when he expressed to me the extent of his engagement with Wallace's work, and um, Julius, like Wallace, is fiction writer who's also studying philosophy. And this is, you know, I identify with a lot of the things that uh, preoccupy Wallace just by the way of trying to solve formal problems that any novelist will solve, and also by the chance of being generationally so close to him. And he wrote so vividly, so persuasively about the exact dilemma of being born you know, between 1960 and 1960. So I can't help but identify with him in those ways. And then there's this other thing that is, to me, much more than for someone like Julius, a barrier, which is that he was such a powerful thinker on the level of uh, philosophical abstraction. And he was so engaged with, well, with things like Wittgenstein's, the, the, the problems and paradoxes that a philosopher like Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein frames about language that are very, very, intimidatingly alien to me. I can't grasp it. I, I myself came to uh, writing novels from an arts background. I made paintings before I knew uh, stories and, and, and novels. And so I think in plastic terms, I think about the stuff of fiction, people, characters, situations, and I'm just helpless with this philosophical material. But you know, he sort of, I mean, he, he wound up closer to you in that sense than he began. Um, one of the pleasures for David when he was first hired by Pomona, um, he wrote to his friends to say one of the best things of all was that there were no graduate students here. <laughs> <laughs> and he could finally get rid of all the sort of literary theory stuff that he, he was, he was, um, he was at Illinois State University. Uh, but weirdly enough, Illinois State University was one of the foremost publishers of avant-garde fiction in the country. It had all the archive and press there, the review of contemporary fiction, and fiction collective, I think also called it. So uh, he used to be hounded and people would come to study with David at ISU who were writers of that sort and they would be stunned to find that on the first day David would write on, on the blackboard the names of all the major theorists from Derrida and Devon and uh, Lyotard and then he would say I know about these people but I don't want to hear about them. <laughs> so he came here and he was delighted really to find people more like John and who, who, who believed in character and voice and, and you know who were had it more from a painter's background or, or, or the idea of creating, you know, um, I'm not I'm putting this too simply, but basically we weren't going to be so dependent on these kind of intellectual struggles. Wittgenstein possibly being an exception. I'm not sure. I still think, David, that the question of what I think a philosopher would call use value was a background uh, framework for his. The problems and ambitions in his fiction, which is he wanted to know what it was for, what it was good to do, and it it was a a question that isn't one that necessarily preoccupies a fiction writer, because you can also come from a you know 
art for art's sake, to use a very poor English uh, context oh, wait, where, wait, where the idea of making something that's uselessly beautiful. Give an example of what you mean by use value. Um, well, I think and the candidate is very interesting idea. I, really I think that that and, and this isn't meant critically, but I think it's it it's striking to me as something I identify in his work again and again and again because it, I don't I don't relate to it. He's making the problem of why tell stories, uh, what you know, what good is it, and is it possibly not good? Is it possible that entertaining someone or making something charming or beguiling or involving, yeah, like like the film in addressing moral problems. Addressing moral problems. Oh, but John, that, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I think that that is a thing that he saw as being central to his work and that not every writer fiction does. But, but also right. the, the prominence of an anxiety like, what if I made something that was like television? But do you not uh, have any anxiety in the room that you write something too amusing? Or is it, there's no there's no level at which something can be too amusing? Well, I, I mean, I don't mean to make it a, a trap for myself and then fall into it with, with that. I, I think that I want, I want things to be beautiful and, right. and enormously diverting. Certainly, certainly, David worried about writing something too beautiful. I mean, I, you know, his prose is often that that very special sound of infinite jest is, I think, partially an attempt to keep you from thinking he's writing beautiful prose. But if you read some of the system, he could write conventionally. He refers to the great mimic. He could really write almost anything he wanted to just by reading someone and imitating them. But he could write a mellifluous. Well, and in fact, there's some passages of an extraordinary, rapturous. Uh, right. Right. So I, I see what you're saying about that. So I, I just think it's, uh, I mean, in some ways I'm out of my depth immediately. I bring in the philosophical concepts and then I have to hand them off to someone else because I'm really not good at them. But um, it seems to be a preoccupation with, uh, is it, a, is it a, an instrument uh, of positive value in the world to tell stories is, is, is a concern. And of course, in a way, the emblematic figure for this is the, 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 you know, the nightmare of the film itself, Infinite Jest, which enthralls you so much that nothing else can ever happen for you afterwards. Right, there's, there's, a, there's a basically videotape which you can watch is so addictive that you are unable to ever stop watching it, so you know, it kills you with its, with its power to entertain you. I'm curious, you know, you know what, do you remember the book well enough to remember the, what's on the videotape, do you remember? It's not what you'd expect, it's actually a mother uh, it's a view from a crib of a mother. I think it's soft focus, and she keeps saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, you know, it's not, it's not what you think, it's not what these film cops. Um, there's clearly some other idea in his mind about why that's so relentlessly interesting and addictive for a viewer. So, uh, before we open up the floor for audience questions, I just want to ask each of our panelists to pick some, some work of Wallace's that is not infinite jest that you, you think is particularly worth reading now, maybe because you think it's particularly bad, maybe because you think it's particularly good or particularly interesting. Uh, but something you'd like to recommend to the room uh, that is the big deal. Well, I mean, I, I, I would recommend one, although I think there's plenty of plenty of places, and I, I, I'm hoping that Laura will recommend some nonfiction. Uh, but if she doesn't, that's up to her. But because uh, the nonfiction is very interesting, I haven't so much time at all on it. You know, I, I think one one story is that I find absolutely stunning is a story called Good Old Neon, uh, written quite late in his life, I think, written in 2000, um, which is, you know, there's now the way David left us. You know, there are overtones to so many of these stories. But of course, when he wrote this story, he was you know, he was a 42 year old man. It's, it's a suicide story, but it's really a story about self-hatred and self-knowledge and self-realization. It's, it's basically, uh, I think, one of the most stunning pieces of, of, of short fiction that I've ever read. So that's an old neon, that's in the, um, the volume of Oblivion. And it also tries, I don't know how many people have read or tried Phil King, but it's also really about, uh, one thing I find so stunning about that story, it's really about almost a non-Western concept of time, in that you're, you sort of have a person who's committed suicide in a car, narrating the story of having committed suicide in the car, at the same time bringing in a person named David Wallace, who's thinking about 
the person who committed the suicide in the car. So the time frame of the story, I'm trying to be speaking speak on his own favor, but I'd be very curious from a technical point of view how you do this, because to me it's an absolutely stunning little piece of fiction. And it's also, for me as a biographer, kind of wonderful, because, well, first of all, you know, the biography, uh, you, you can't help with this, help this with you know, every, every love story is a ghost story. This is, this is David's ghost story. Um, but also, you know, it's a happy moment in the midst of a fairly difficult time when he wasn't really getting to write in the way that he pleased and he wrote this thing very quickly, and I think it's an astonishing piece of fiction and worth reading. That is, it's a tremendous story, and, and technically, you know, a name that I've never seen put, I mean, I had mean, this, got me answered, maybe I'm just not, I haven't bumped into this, I never seen Nabokov and Wallace put together, but the way they, and technically, the way they each can handle time and conflate it and the spiral inside and outside of moments, making uh, a kind of association between two different uh, points of view is is, is staggering, uh, and it, uh, that story in particular reminds me of some of the Bokov's effects um, on that level. Uh, well, um, I'm going to mention two things. One is there's a very long and really problematic um, uh, short story. It's the last piece in his first story collection, Girl with Curious Hair, uh, called Westward: The Course of Empire, which is, you know, it's like um, it's watching the uh, the breakdown uh, happen. He's trying to write about writing and writers and his, and his own ambition for his work, and it manifests all of the difficulties that I think he then, you know, masters later on. And and it really also happens to really kind of describe the world uh, as as he knew it. Uh, the world of fiction writing in a certain era. It's a snapshot of the anxieties of the, the writer inventing himself uh, at a very, you know, very high level disaster area of, of, of a story. And then the other thing that I was just rereading and it, and it took my breath away and it, uh, it's the last of the, the last of the sequence, not numerically, but the last of the sequence brief interviews with hideous men. Uh, it's brief interview number 20. Um, and it's almost the last piece of that book. Uh, and it's a, a, it's a horror story in many ways of uh, the male psyche, but also um, completely fully realized uh, description of, I think, all of the, these questions of uh, the attempt to believe in another human being, the attempt to transmit love and and awareness across this barrier of self. Um, and, it, and I have just finished Pale King because I only just read Pale King now, kind of uh, in, the, in the run up to talking to you here today. And suddenly I thought, uh, number 20, you know, interview number 20, is doing a lot of what he's trying to do in, in Pale King. And it gets there. I think it, 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 it predicts a possible route of success for that. That unfinished novel in a lot of ways. Oh, it's quite dark. It's darker than the tone of most of the uh, Well, I, I, I feel like I should now pick some. All right, questions. sorry. But, you know, I, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm often talking to people who want me to tell them why they should read this fiction because it's nonfiction that's traditionally been more popular. And a lot of people have read the nonfiction, but really don't want to not get the tackle and adjust. So I usually recommend Girl with Curious Hair because I think it's a strong short story collection has a lot of variety to it. So that you know it gives a sense of the different, you know, different types of things that you can do. But it's not I'm not the biggest fan of room of the system. And and oblivion and and, and room interviews are very dark. Um, so uh, I always think that I recommend that collection as an easier way to get in. But um, but I think his essay about Dostoevsky is one of the uh, is, you know, he didn't write a lot of literary criticism. I really like that one. And I really like uh, E. Unibum. E. e, e Unibus Plural. E. Unibus Plural. I can never get that straight. It's, they, you know, as a literary critic, I'm just going to pick those two pieces of book literary criticism. Um, the, um, the Dostoevsky one, which was originally in um, uh, a supposedly fun thing, I'll never do 
again, in fact, I, I reviewed that book for the New York Times, um, for the New York Times Book Review, and the Gavin that I have, the advanced reader's copy, had the Dostoevsky essay in there. And then at the last minute, like I made a whole reference to it because I felt that it rounded out the collection in this particular way that had to do with the position of, of, of David Foster Wallace in the culture. And I really thought that essay should have been in there. And somehow, I don't know if you heard about that, or I don't know, so he sent me a letter about explaining why it didn't wind up being in there. And then I wrote back saying it really should have been in there. And, um, and so, so it didn't actually, it was eventually published. Why was it pulled out of the motion? I love that piece too. Uh, I don't mind the piece, but it was too long, I guess. I, you know, I mean, there were other things in there that I could have looked at, like the David Lynch piece, that, uh, that uh, I thought the Dustin piece was strong. But this was more about what he was trying to do. Yeah, but if you're, if you're a publisher, you want David Lynch on yeah. the Dustin. <laughs> it does show up in the next collection. Um, and um, 
he had, you know, one of the paradoxes of, of David's death is that in many, many ways this was the happiest time of his life, partially because he was with this woman, Karen Green, who he met shortly after he got here and had to be married. But also beyond that, just because he was really, just really much happier. He just loved teaching. Uh, he loved his students. Um, and it's also interesting because over the years, he was, I mean, one of the things in biography, you have to edit out things that are just too repetitive. I mean, he, everywhere he went, he groaned about teaching. I mean, teaching here was a kind of a, a death sentence. And um, he always felt that the more he taught, the less he could write. So I mean, it's complicated at the moment where he's not really writing very successfully. But he doesn't feel anger at his teaching at all. He, Really, really loves it. First off, thank you all so much for speaking tonight. My name is Lee, and my question is about David Foster Wallace's legacy, specifically his Kenyon College commencement address, which was republished and so many times, so widely, even in the little pop edition, you know, it's all the checkout counters with the references to suicide taken out of it. And I wanted to ask if you feel that the that people reading that and that people writing and those other works becomes an avenue for misunderstanding him or understanding him better. Well, Laura, Laura has a line. Uh, it was only after his death that David Foster Wallace could be properly misunderstood. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's amazing having just um, written about him when it had just came out. I 
actually an individual task to um, chart out an area where writers, uh, where you're making a direct engagement with the writer's uh, work. If it's done, you know, the collective uh, apprehension can probably only be a sort of, um, uh, and I, I don't, in this word in a very harsh way, but a kind of cartoon of anything uh, to do with, you know, when you go, I mean, uh, when you, one of my very most signal artists in any realm for me is Mark Rothko, he's a painter, and he slashed his wrists in his studio. And what I do with that fact when I go to a museum and I'm standing before a Rothko, uh, is a matter of my own personal management. But what happens when you mention a, a life story and a biographic, biographical outline and the work is not in the foreground can only not, not do it in injustice. It simply isn't an engagement with the work. The work waits. The work is waiting for you to decide whether or not you want to go there and find out what it has for you. Uh, and that situation will persist no matter how large or small the biographical interference zone is. In this case, it's, I think it's very prominent uh, for, for a lot of people. It's really problematic. I think for someone who was, in, for most people, an ambiguous figure while he was alive, um, his death meets a kind of a very narrative of the romantic suffering of artists, and so it enables people to sort of simplify him or to easily create a beautiful myth about the suffering of artists and how if you suffer, then you must be a great artist. And that kind of, you know, like a lot of the, the romantic ideal that's very familiar and very safe to people is in that story. And so, um, so it becomes easier to categorize someone I mean, I'll, I'll take a shot at it. I, I mean, it seems to me, you know, that I'm not, I actually not quite sure whether John came out on the side of biography or against it. So. I read biographies of right. artists I care about compulsively. I'll read your, your book. It is published. No, really, I mean, curiosity about these things is part of caring about human life and also its, it's narrative, its helpless compulsion towards narrative arcs and your own projections of meaning onto those. I just think that then the work awaits, and you either go to it and, and deliver yourself to it on its terms, or, or you haven't yet done that. There's the difference between biography and then taking a life and making it conform to a popular myth. But on the, on the other hand, I mean, I mean I'll, I'll, you know, I, I, think, you know, I think that David's life, um, it is, there is a narrative there that's almost, I mean, it's a, you know, it's a, it, it, there's a narrative there that's almost a cliche. I mean, I think one can also make it more complicated, um, and, I, and I think the more detail you add to it, the more complicated it does become. But you know what I was first thinking about whether I wanted to take it, this being my work about David again with this New Yorker piece shortly after his death, and I had never wanted to be a biographer. Um, See biographers. I was going to cross the street, um, <laughs> and pity at their job. But I thought there was actually something different here. That, that David's in, David's life. For instance, if you ask me, if you want to be John Updike's biographer, if you want to be Tony Morrison's biographer, I'd say no. There's a way in which David was actually living out of certain preoccupations, not just of his own, but also of, of my generation. Um, I don't think you need to read. Uh, on the cover. I don't think you need to read my book to read David's work. Um, but I think that actually his life is really, really interesting. And some, to some extent, it's really interesting because of what he wrote. And to some extent, it's just really interesting because the battles he fought were the battles of his generation, battles against depression, battles against addiction, battles against, um, you know, battles against losing yourself in the vast sort of entertainment uh, spectation complex that this country has become. Um, you know, I think there are moral lessons in his life. They're not simple. I mean, I don't think anything about David was, was, was simple. But I think, I, I, I think, you know, 
there's something about David that's also, frankly, you know, and this is somewhat what Laura's talking about, about you know, there's something about David that's never become more than a writer. Uh, some sort of representative life, some sort of moral guidepost for better or worse, a suggested way to live. And it's my intuition, actually, that many, many people relate to him more through that than his work. I, I don't think that's where you want to end with David. I think you've got to pick up his books and read them. But I think that, that, that I, I, I trust the way people relate to artists. The fact that, that you know, water runs downhill and, and, and no effort of mine or the clever people in Manhattan who put together these puzzles, you know, he has reached people. And he will continue to reach people. I think he's reaching people um, in a way that's, I, I can't think of a comparable writer. I don't think you can even go back and, and you guys can help me on this. I can't even think about, I think there are writers whose claim to be in the canon is pretty unassailable at this point. And still, I'm not really sure that their lives reach us. Um, so there's something very strange that's gone on here. Um, I think you almost have to look outside of literature or fiction to find people for whom so many so many readers or just people who happen to be alive in this moment uh, are really interested in like, okay, his suffering, I mean, I didn't suffer like him, you know, I'm not that person. I mean, I learned a lot about living and writing about David, and I don't think I would have felt that if I had written about, really, you can just take names of random, many, many William writers, you know, I, he, he was, I mean, certainly he was the wounded healer, or whatever cliche you want, uh, he wasn't the person whose life is a paradigm that God knows, but it's in the suffering and, and, the, and the conflict and the energy um, that, you know, this is, again, an anodyne, but it was all about the wisdom of simple statements that you're first think are stupid. Um, he writes at some point that fiction is supposed to be about what it is to be a fucking human being. It's one of his, you go, go on the internet, you'll see it, type it in, there it is, again, 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 again. But I think his life also can teach us, can teach us that. Um, and in that sense, you know, I feel like in writing about him, I'm of course writing about a writer, and I'm writing you know, critically about a writer, what he succeeds at and what he fails, about the torment of the page, and, and his hopes, all the things that we've been spending our time talking about. But you know, I think for a lot of people, he, he, you know, and I, I suspect this will continue, could be wrong, I could be wrong, that he, he is reaching people as a struggler, as, a, as, a, as an agonist, as a person alive at this time, you know, and that again and again, I feel for myself, uh, a person who was not necessarily expecting to be reached in this way when I first started writing about David. Um, there's something very direct there. Uh, you know, something that just fits right in. Exactly what it is. All right, would you please thank our panelists for being here?